Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you again for coming out as we continue in our events for Adam Smithley. Uh, as you're getting tired of me hearing and introducing myself, right? I'm Professor Peter Calcano. I'm the director of the Center for Public Choice and Market Process. The uh, Center for Public Choice and Market Process uh, does a variety of activities, all with the central mission of expanding the economic and political foundations of a free society. We do these through reading groups, we do it through uh, speaker series, our obvious uh, event here of Adam Smith Week every spring, which has uh, been um, great notoriety across campus and has brought in some uh, renowned speakers. Uh, this year is no exception. I would encourage you to take a look at the material we have set out over here about the center as well as our Market Process Scholars Program, which is our mentoring program. It's a multi-year program for students to become involved in the center, to participate in the activities, but also to engage in research activities, professional development, and to help prepare them both for uh, wherever their next adventure is, and whether it's the professional world, graduate, or nonprofit. Uh, we have flyers here regarding the additional events that are going on over the course of the week. So what you've seen here this week and you've heard tonight are interesting to you. Then again, please grab some flyers to make sure that you're aware of the remaining events uh, or to learn more about the center, for, uh, the center or the Market Process Scholars Program. I also want to draw your attention to um, one other piece of information that our speaker, um, Matt Schuster, brought with him uh, today, which is uh, about Capitaf Colloquiums. So, uh, Milton and Rose Friedman, who uh, I will talk about this evening, uh, had a summer home in Vermont, and it has now been that they've named Capitaf, and they now are holding opportunities for students to go up there and do colloquiums where they will read about Milton Friedman's work, <coughs> directed uh, by faculty who are well versed in his um, his readings and so forth in his writings um, and lead a several day colloquium on that you'll get to actually stay there you have all your meals everything is um, uh, is on the grounds and you get to go to hang out in Vermont which I've been told is extremely beautiful in the area that it is up in the mountains and so forth um, there are, if you are, there are brochures here about this, and you can apply to attend. We've done, uh, they've done groups with various universities, uh, University of Arkansas, Florida State, uh, and so forth, in mixtures, and so they have, again, slots and openings. If this is something that may be of interest to you, then please grab one of these flyers, and uh, Bob Luff will be also applications, and so if you're interested, I have applications, and we can, um, I can provide you with one of those. They've been doing them mostly during the summertime. Yes. <laughs> Everywhere in Vermont is uphill. <laughs> when you, if you do come to visit, you know what I mean. And it snows and gets icy in the winter, and going uphill in ice and snow is hard. So we basically closed the place down from 1st of November till the end of April. So it's mostly. Um, but I would encourage you to do this. It's a, it's a once in a lifetime experience. Uh, at least grab one of the flyers to learn more about it. Uh, there's um, all kinds of detailed information about it. Uh, at this point, I want to bring up Jack Jensen to uh, introduce our speaker in more detail. Hi, I'm Jackie Jensen. I'm a senior here, and I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Bob Chedister. Bob Chedister completed his bachelor and master's degree at the University of Mich Michigan. He is the founder as well as the executive chairman of Free to Choose Network and has over 50 years of experience in television management and program development. He has created many television programs such as Milton Friedman's 1980 World Changing Series, Free to Choose, and in recognition of this achievement, he was awarded an honorary doctorate from Allegheny College. Dr. Chidester has many accomplishments and currently is a leader in the effort to develop a major series on the significance and history of free speech. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chidester. Thank you very much. Uh, the 
the honorary doctorate, I, it, it's nice staying on my wall, but I don't. I, I was told by a colleague who earned a PhD, he said, Baha, anybody can earn a PhD. Uh, if you get an honorary one, it's much more difficult and challenging. Well, whatever. Uh, but uh, that's probably the first time I've been addressed as Dr. Chittister in 40 years. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> but thank you, in any case. I once held on my knees a simple wooden box in which a rainbow lay dusty and broken. It was a set of pastels that had years before belonged to the painter Mary Cassette. And all the colors she used in her work lay open before me. Those shoes she most used, the peaches, the pinks, were worn down to the stubs, while the cool colors Violet, ultramarine, had been set, scarcely touched, to one side. She'd had little patience with darkness, and her heart held only a measure of shadow. I touched the warm dust of those colors, her tools, and left there with light on the tips of my hands. We are raised with this bromide that a picture's worth a thousand words. I'm talking about words today. I want to suggest to you that's wrong. That it's the reverse. As a videographer, let's pretend you're all videographers. Try to imagine how you could, in a video, capture light on the tips of my fingers. And the reason being is that it's in your mind that you're going to capture that most tingling kind of sense of what those paints and colors meant on Mary Cassette. Here's my final test on that, by the way. Consider one word, mom. Can you imagine any single picture that you could devise that would convey everyone else in this room, what mom means to you and to them. Words are very, very powerful. And we're going to chat today about Milton Friedman and his use of words. I met Milton in uh, uh, Jan January of 1977 and until he died uh, in 2006. I had the privilege of spending an enormous number of hours with initially working on the TV series, <coughs> literally was involved in some of the discussions and negotiations that were held with Hartog Gracevanovich for the book, and the book was based on a TV series. Uh, and in that context, uh, I, I, I have this feeling that I may hold the record for the longest postdoctoral in economics in history. Uh, because what was happening on those visits, I'd go to California, he was then at the Hoover Institution. So I'd go to a dinner with Milton, and there would be Jimmy Buchanan, or there would be uh, on and on and on, I could name a dozen different Nobel laureates that I had the opportunity to, on a regular basis, interact with. Now, you don't have to have a formal course of study to gain a great deal from those opportunities. And one of the things I want to do today is try to share with you some of what I gained from that. And hopefully it will open up some doors of insight for you. Uh, I want to start off by giving you a sense of why I think of Milton Friedman as notable. Only I'm not going to do it. I'm going to let George Schultz do it for me. I have spoken around the world quite a bit, and I frequently get asked in the Q&A part of that, people will say, well, you've dealt with presidents and prime ministers and kings and so on over a long period of time, and who has made the greatest difference? And so I ruminate about Gorbachev. 
one person or another, of course, in the end, come around to Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, and I get through talking about them, and I said, well, all things considered, I have to say, Milton Friedman. And I think you all know, and you could give, the reasons why you would say, all things considered, when it comes to really making a difference, it would be Milton. And I suspect that Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher might give you the same answer because they have been powerfully influenced by his ideas. Now, we know Milton's prowess as an intellect, as a theorist, but we also know, and has been brought out by earlier comments, how insistent he is that if you have a theory, you better test it with facts. And a theory that can't be tested better be reformulated so it can be tested. And you've got to bring the facts to bear. So I know, Milton, you're tone deaf, but it isn't going to bother you. I'm going to sing, but you won't know it. So here's my song. My methodological tribute. A fact without a theory is like a ship without a sail, is like a boat without a rudder, is like a kite without a tail. A fact without a theory is as sad as sad can be. But if there's one thing worse in this universe, it's a theory, I said a theory, I mean a theory without a fact. And I want to now also share with you something that the opinion that he gave is shared by some other interesting people. You've heard of Larry Summers? former president of Harvard, uh, under Obama, he was what? He was uh, chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, I think. But he's a uh, noted economist. Uh, two of his, I think it was two of his uncles were Nobel Prize winners. I'm trying to think who they, which ones they were. Samuelson and, and uh, whatever. I, can't, I, I know the other one may come later. In any case, Obviously, a person whose traditions basically are on the left, and you would tend to ascribe Milton to be on the right, although those phrases I use with a great hesitation in terms of them being fairly weak substitutes for the reality. But here's what Larry Summers had to say about Milton Friedman. No contemporary economist anywhere on the political spectrum combined Mr. Friedman's commitment to clarity of thought and argument to scientifically examining evidence and to identifying policies that will make societies function better. So, I've given you evidence of Milton's uh, power uh, as an intellect. I happen to be fortunate enough that I can give you a little bit of sense of Milton's character of why, even if you disagree with his ideas, you should understand that he was a humanitarian of the first order. Theory, tested by facts, change your theory, test that, change your facts, and then come to conclusions, not come to a conclusion emotionally and then go out and find the facts that support that <coughs> assumption. Milton was a scientist in, in, in that context. Now, let me give you a sense of his character. Uh, I'm somewhat of a fitness freak. Uh, my brother ran a marathon when he was age 39. Uh, no, I was age 39, he was then 31. And I thought, what are you doing running a marathon? And I went, watched him run the marathon, and went home and started running. And I've been running ever since until last August when I ran my first 10, last 10K and decided that if I was going to continue to travel and 
come and talk to you people, I better have better stop <coughs> my knees, which I've been lucky so far. I had a little minor surgery. So I, I'm a fitness guy. So I show up at Milton's apartment. This is somewhere around his 90th birthday, 91st birthday. I walk in the door and he says, Bob, how are you? How you doing? Uh, did you run today? No, he said, how many miles did you run today? I said, no, I didn't run any miles today. But I did do 250 stomach crunches. What's a stomach crunch? Okay, now there's one where I will go back to my earlier comment. And that's where a picture is worth more than that. Because me trying to describe to him stomach crunch, I didn't take that on. So I got down on there before their apartment, and I do a couple stomach crunches. And, and you, you tend to do it, and I do it like this, and I'm kind of, and then I realized Milton Friedman is lying on the floor right next to me doing tiny little <laughs> stomach crunches. And on the other side, I'm looking over at Milton, Rose is getting down on this side. They, he was a person of unbelievable curiosity. Someone that, that in the classroom was demanding, but as an individual in, in interaction was as generous a person as you could ever possibly believe and terribly interested in what you were doing and what, what you were about. Now there's one thing more I want to add before I start sharing some quotes with you. I come up from a family where political discussion is best described as yelling at each other at dinner tables. Uh, and so until I met Milton, I, I just, that was my sense that, you know, you were always, if you got into a political discussion, uh, you, you really, this is your, this is your enemy here. You're not going to be nice, etc. And I was astonished that Milton would carry on these discussions and these debates with people. And he was reasonable, he was pleasant, he was cordial, even when they would accuse him of being an idiot. And he would just respond with more facts, more information, a story about how things work, etc. So after I've known him for 10, 15 years, I asked him, I said, Milton, one of the things I gained from you was that you can be, uh, dis you can disagree with someone without being disagreeable. Now, I didn't say I had learned that or gotten that. I, I had to admit I was still struggling with that because if you think about it, that's one of the most difficult things you can do. Yet Milton was so good at it. So I asked him on camera, Milton, is that part of your DNA? Were you born with that kind of disposition? Or did you somehow or other train yourself? He said, oh, I, I wasn't that way. <clears throat> he told me the story. He was working in Washington, D.C. I think he was there for one year with some department. And except for the war, that was the only time he was there or near it. And he, and he by the way, always said to people, go to Washington, D.C. and work for a year, and then never go back. Uh, you need to see what it's like, but you don't want to contribute to what's going on. And there was an economist from the Department of Agriculture in this meeting. And she made some comments about whatever they were talking about. And Milton just tore into her. He, was, he, he accused her of not knowing what she was talking about. He was very, very aggressive with her, bordering on nasty. And he said, two weeks later, I realized I was wrong. And I vowed to myself, I am not going to do that ever again. Now, Rose is sitting right next to me, and I can guarantee you that under no circumstances would Rose ever tell even a white lie. And he turned to her and he said, I think I've been pretty good at that, haven't you? And she had to admit it. She said, yes, I think you have. Rose and I, in fact, thought that he was to a fault in doing that. There were times when he should have been a little less agreeable with the people who were calling him names. But I wanted to share those two things with you to give you a sense of this individual and his wife, and they were a team beyond any 
you can imagine in terms of their lifelong association and affection for each other. Now let's dive into some of the wisdom that Milton came up with. And this first one ties directly to the point I just made about Milton and the way he approached people. It also ties to something that I have come to a, a, a conviction I've come to recently, um, is a free society by definition cannot exist without compromise. The Bill of Rights is a compromise. They're really tested. Freedom of speech is a compromise. Freedom of religion is a compromise. Anyone want to suggest why it's a compromise? What do each of those say? Everyone has different beliefs. Everyone has different beliefs. So what's the compromise? What was <coughs> prior to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, what was government likely, what, what was the government structure likely to state? Pardon? Everyone all people and beliefs. No, I'm saying prior to our Constitution. With the European tradition. You had to follow one way. Yes. You if you if you live in France, you better be a Catholic. If you live in Holland, you can be anything you want. I'm talking I'm not giving you the whole historic timeline because that takes it. But but Holland was the first place, and England picked up from them where there was a freedom of conscience. You, could, you were not penalized for being a member of a specific church. So see what I mean? Freedom of religion is a compromise in any group of individuals because there will be some individuals, and there may be some in this room, who have such strong commitments to a particular faith that you really feel, at least you consider it, using force to make them believe the way you do. But freedom of religion then is a compromise. It says, I'm going to give up my right to force you to believe my way, and you're going to give up your right to believe my way. So I've come to a very interesting point, because libertarians tend to be, oh, you know, we're not going to compromise on anything. you got to have it this way or not. What? Well, very honestly, that's just ignorant. And I accused myself of being ignorant until maybe two or three years ago when I started to realize, by definition, a free society has to be built on a compromise. Either that or your colony of ants. Milton's quote, the ideal is unanimity among responsible individuals achieved on the basis of free and full discussion. From this standpoint, the role of the market, as already noted, is that it permits unanimity without conformity, that it is a system of effectively proportional representation. The way to think about that is, how many times you vote in the last two years? Show of hands, anybody vote in the last two years? How many times you vote once? Anybody vote twice? I voted probably 20 times today. And the votes that I made today are ones that satisfied me. I voted to drink by instead of Coca-Cola. like it, it works fine. Uh, I don't have to like some, I don't like the, uh, some of the ones that are more acidic. But those are all votes. And I get what I want. So I'm getting uh, a satisfaction of my needs without taking anything away from you. On the other hand, I can't name any politician, and I'm now 81 years old, and in all the times I've voted, I cannot name a single politician that ever delivered anything closely approximating what I had hoped from them. And that's what Milton is commenting on here, that the market can be a tool and should be understood as a tool that we resolve those issues and get the better answer. I still use Colgate 
toothpaste because that's what my parents used. Uh, 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 but uh, my fact that I'm using it is voluntary and it doesn't keep you from using crests or whatever else you want to use. Now, I assume you all understand the market is a, is a tool, it's a vehicle, it's a process. Uh, the agora in the Greek sense was an example of that progress. It was, it was the activity that went on there, not the physical sense that we think of it as the agora. Okay, but here's what I want you to expand on. That market is about ideas and beliefs. We tend to think of it in a totally physical terms. My toothpaste or deodorant, whatever, but it's not, it's everywhere. Ideas and beliefs, wants and needs, how about this one? Desires and tastes. That's a market. And again, if you apply Milton's quote, you're then allowing for the diversity of choice that I think most all of us want. The United States, I think, is the most open example of that in the world, uh, evidenced recently by those who say, why? even some of our own politicians say, why do we need 50 versions of deodorant? Well, the question is, do we need 50, is, isn't do we need 50 versions of deodorant? The question is, who's gonna decide which of those 50 we don't need? As soon as you start that, now you're on the slippery slope of others, and maybe it's, maybe it's us in one role telling others what they should do, and others in their role telling us what to do. But in each case, it takes away the issue of free agency, which, by the way, is my lodestone. That's what I'm interested in. Uh, by the way, uh, Milton was very good at this, and one of the things that I started to play around with about five, six years ago is a phrase called, who chooses, who benefits, who pays? Many of you may have heard that or whatever. Who chooses, who benefits, who pays? I added one to that, what's fair? And as I go through the quotes today, I want to tie, tie to a little degree, tie my, his quotes to those uh, four questions. Uh, and let me start off with, Milton Friedman on the deficit and taxes. There's this recent debate over the reform tax bill and people screaming, well, we're paying for it with increased deficit. Here's Milton Friedman's answer to that. I'm in favor of cutting taxes under any circumstances and for any excuse for any reason whenever it's possible. So there's no question in my mind that he, he was said, damn the torpedoes. Uh, it's going to increase the federal debt, fine. Damn the tor torpedoes, cut the taxes. Why would he say that? Because he gets the Amen, sister. <laughs> and I hope all of you get that quickly. Because Milton said, look, Fundamentally, the deficit is a political issue, and politicians are not likely to be very good at dealing with it, and, and so we could waste an awful lot of time beating our heads over that. At least at this point, let's do one thing. Let's get as much money in the pockets of every single one of you as we can. So you're making decisions, not someone else. But now, Milton was, Milton was very good. Remember. Uh, George Schultz and uh, his the theories, thesis. Look, now listen to this one. The widespread enthusiasm for reducing government taxes and other impositions is not matched by a comparable enthusiasm for eliminating government programs, except programs that benefit other people. Uh, in our promotion for free to choose, one of the things we put out was a statement by Milton that says, 
if you want to know why we have as much government we, as we do, go and look in a mirror. Because he basically said, we all are contributors to that. Um, and it's a question then of uh, who benefits. In other words, we're trading off benefits. Uh, how many of you know the name Tom Soul? Anybody? Not very many? Whoa, not very many people know Tom Sowell in this room. Very noted economist has written, I don't know, what, 35, 40 books. Uh, he has two books, Basic Economics, and what's the name of the second one in this that he did? Applied Basic Economics. Applied Basic Economics. And um, a very, very insightful thinker and uh, Son of a gun, I must have missed it on the other sheet when I was talking about. Yeah, here it is. Sorry. But Tom Sowell made this, this I, I couldn't, couldn't resist including this quote, even though it's not, not known. But Tom Sowell said the following, and this gets back to this point I was making, where Milton says, give the, ta give the money back to people here. Because what's the political game? Tom Sowell. The fundamental problem is that politicians like to give things away to voters. And government doesn't produce anything to give. They can rob Peter to pay Paul, but this will lose them a vote every time they gain one. The trick is to rob Peter to pay Paul, rob Paul to pay Peter, and get both the votes. And Milton carried that forward by saying, if you look deeply enough, government will end up being on both sides of almost any issue you want to look at. Classic one, cigarettes. At the same time that the government had bureaus and spending millions of dollars to impose all kinds of challenges to keep people from smoking, they were subsidizing tobacco farmers. Very important kinds of ways to look at things. Now let me make sure I don't get out of order and I had this so brilliantly aligned until I missed that particular quote by Tom Sowell. So who benefits? As I'm saying, the politician. The politician is the one, public choice theory, says that it doesn't make a difference whether you're in the private sector or the public sector, you're going to act on your self-interest. If I'm in the public sector, I need customers. You know, we think of them as we're, we're providing services to clients. Well, they're customers. They're no different than a customer going into Walmart. And the people who are running those government agencies, are, their incentive is to treat you like a customer. They don't always do a good job because of, in some cases, there's no alternative like the post office. So they, they don't do a very good job. Uh, so the question there becomes, why do we then continue to turn over more and more of our lives to government decisions and action? And I am not putting forth to you a Republican agenda. The Republicans and the Democrats both operate on the basis of the incentives as Tom Sowell puts it out there. The challenge for us is to begin to see that in such a way that we pull them back, going back to this compromise, pull them back to the fact that the best decisions and outcomes are made when every one of you make that decision, arriving in something you should know about and think about, spontaneous order, which was uh, kind of Put in, the, in that terms by Friedrich Hayek, whom you may have some awareness of. Okay, now let me go to a very controversial Friedman quote. Uh, Few trends could so thoroughly undermine the very foundations of our free society as the acceptance by corporate officials, some of you may eventually be those corporate officials, uh, of a social responsibility 
other than to make as much money for their stockholders as possible. How many of you know that quote? How many of you feel that's correct? Uh, you think Milton's right? That General Motors has no other obligation than to make as much money for you as a, sh a shareholder of their stock, uh, and that's their primary objective. Yeah, go ahead. In general, why do you agree with that? Yeah, do you? Well, sure, I, yeah, I'd be interested to know why you agree with that. Why you agree that, that he's right. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I think you would add the word as long as you don't use force or fraud in the yeah, deal exactly. that, you're, that you're doing. That's a classic libertarian perspective on it. Now, uh, what I want to do is share with you uh, a little more on a personal level. Uh, I get all the time during this period of time in my long postdoctoral, uh, people begin to understand that I have access to Milton that they don't have, and they would like to get to know Milton. And so I get a call from John Mackey. Anybody know who John Mackey is? Anybody studying food industry? Uh, and Amazon's latest acquisition, they, well, not latest. About a year ago, Amazon made a major acquisition. Whole Foods Market. John Mackey is the founder of Whole Foods Market. And at the time, that still is CEO. We saw him about a month and a half ago. Uh, but he came to me, and he wanted to meet Milton Tree. So I arranged the dinner, and uh, as we got together at the restaurant, his associate came with him. Uh, actually, John came over to me, and he said, Bob, I, I thank you. He's, and it's one of these, Milton's my hero, but he's absolutely wrong on this corporate responsibility thing, and I want to challenge him. Is that okay? I said, hey, go right ahead. <laughs> and they had at it. At the end, and John Mackey has started something called Conscious Capitalism. Uh, I will not make fun of it, but I'm going to give you a definition of it that Milton gave it, which I believe is true. Uh, conscious Capitalism is now an organization that John Mackey, it's his key focus. And he's, and he's right about one thing. He says people, most people start businesses because they perceive a need and they have as a purpose solving that need. Now, they have to eventually, either themselves or through an associate, have enough business savvy that they can make it profitable to do whatever they're doing. But their drive initially is not to make all that money. Steve Jobs is a good example. He got kicked out of Apple, and he had millions and millions of dollars. Why did he go to the trouble and struggle? And I will guarantee you it was not easy for him to work his way back in, take over the company, and take it to much higher levels wasn't so he could add to his millions and billions of dollars. Anyway, John Mackey's, what his argument is, that it has to be about stakeholders. That you, you have to worry about your vendors and your customers and this and that and that. At the end of the evening, we're driving back to Milton's apartment. Uh, he and Rosa and I, I'm driving him there. And Milton turns to me, very interesting fellow, Mackey, very interesting. And uh, I think what, he, what he's come up with there is a useful fiction. And what Milton meant by that was John Mackey was agreeing with Milton Friedman, but he was stating it in a different way that felt to him to be more ethical or more moral. I don't know. In a way, it was a good business tactic. So the issue then of who pays? Uh, I show this as a quote. Uh, and I I guess, yeah, I guess this is Milton's. The reason I'm hesitating, because it is one of mine, one, uh, uh, the idea is one that I feel very strongly about. Who pays? Because this gets back then to this whole issue of the corporation and what it does. Milton's quote, is businesses do not pay taxes, they collect taxes from their employees, stockholders, and customers on behalf of the government. Now, think 
about it straightforward. Some of you are studying business. You, the government passes a new tax on your business. It's individuals who are going to pay that tax. Either you're going to pay it because you decide that you're going to eat, eat, the different, eat that. You're going to pay it out of your operating costs, and you're not going to raise your costs any because you're afraid if you do that, you'll lose customers. So you're going to pay it. Or you raise your costs, which means you ship it off to the customers. Or you do like Walmart was accused of doing, and I guess they tried, they did it, which is they, they try to enforce with their vendors the lowest possible price for the product that's delivered. But there's a goose and the golden egg story there that you ought to be aware of, which is Walmart can only do that so far, and they're going to lose that vendor, which is a critical problem for them. So they can't. They can't beat the person down to the point where they're not making any money. But the issue then is to be careful that you understand all these slogans that people come up with. You know, oh, government can pay for that. Oh, corporations can pay. Let's have the corporations pay all the taxes. That's a slogan. I bet you've heard that. You're hearing something close to it right now in the political arena. It all comes back to you and I, one way or the other. Now, the last one, what's fair, this one, I, I don't have a, a Friedman quote on it, uh, although, well, I do, but it's not, it's not my answer to the question, it's, <clears throat> well, in a way it is. Let me, let me read you the quote, sorry. Uh, I'm constantly challenging myself, as you say here, and I urge you all to do that. <coughs> Uh, a recent quote I like is something like this. Uh, answers, uh, answers lead to, uh, 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 what's the right word? I, this is a paraphrase, I'm sorry. Answers lead to understand, but questions of the answers lead to discovery. So that in effect, I urge all of you, don't ever stop asking questions. If you're too shy to ask them in public, ask them in your head. What, what about, what about, why is that, why is that? And every time you answer the answer, come up with an answer, refine it further. If you want to be a scientist, I'm just giving you one of the ways to get there, to constantly be the skeptic and testing. Well, uh, Milton's quote is this, the society that puts equality before freedom will end up with neither. The society that puts freedom before equality will end up with a great measure of both. My answer to what's fair is simplistic. And I understand it's simplistic, and there will be circumstances where, I don't know, it's hard for me to imagine where I wouldn't agree, wouldn't, where I would be willing to compromise or change it. And it's pretty straightforward. You have a computer. Uh, we've just agreed that you're going to sell me that computer for $25. And we shake hands on that. Okay. Now, in that transaction, that was fair, although not quite, for this reason. The circumstances here put him in a coerced position. He was... He probably thought, hey, I'm not going to sell you that for $25. But he was coerced to saying, OK. So in that sense, I use coercion. But I'm just using him as an example. So assuming then, you told me $25, I walk away, and next week I sell it for $500. Was that unfair? I didn't force you to sell it to me. I didn't. I, I had to add a little coercion thing, because here it's artificial, and you probably felt a little less. But assuming that you actually did sell it, if you sold it to me for $25, you bought, that's what it was worth. If I then sell it a week later for $500, how does my benefiting, the $450 worth, make it an unfair transaction? It doesn't. That is so profoundly important, that simple little statement, because ask yourself the next question. If that isn't, the point at which we stop in judging fairness of interactions, where does it take us? 
assume you don't think it's fair or I don't think it's fair, what is the next step, which I don't think we should ever take? We should learn that it's that first step that's the critical one and that we act to our own self-interest and be very careful not to enter into deals. <coughs> and part, part of this is we're in into deals we don't know the outcome of. You, I didn't know, you didn't know, that this was an antique computer that somebody over in Afghanistan wanted for their collection, who knows. So there's knowledge that's involved and uh, uh, differences in knowledge between you and me in how that trans works out. But at the time we shook hands, we both felt we knew what the situation was and we agreed. That's fair. Now, I don't think it's fair, you don't think it's fair. What are we gonna do? We're gonna ask her which is fair. Do you understand, do all of you understand what we have just done by that step? Because it's not just her. I'm using her as a symbol, isn't it? Because we're turning to a third party. What are we then saying, either in the private sector or the government sector, we create a market for people who are going to determine what is fair rather than the parties who are involved. And as soon as you do that, you're on a slippery slope to problems. And lawyers out the gazoo, et cetera, et cetera. So please, that's one that I've spent a lot of time thinking about, and I hope I would, would, that it would be something you would retain and think about. Now, I want to close with another piece of poetry. I really love poetry. And then we'll have a few minutes for Q&A. We stood on the rented patio while the party went on inside. You knew the groom from college. I was a friend of the bride. We hugged the brownstone wall behind us, keep our dress clothes dry, and watch the sudden summer storm floodlit against the sky. The rain was like a waterfall of brilliant heated light, cool and silent as the stars. The storm hid from the night. To my surprise, you took my arm. A gesture you didn't explain, and we spoke in whispers, as if we too might imitate the rain. Then suddenly the storm receded, and swiftly as it came, the doors behind us opened up. The hostess called your name. I watched you merge into the group, aloof, yet polite. We didn't speak another word except to say goodnight. Why does that evening's memory return with this night's storm. Party 20 years ago, its disappointments warm. There are so many might have beens. What ifs that won't stay buried? Other cities, other jobs, strangers we might have married. And memory insisted on pining for places it never went. As if life can be happy. That's what we want in our lives. We want that sense of exploration, discovery, and the happiness that comes from that adventure we took. But what drives me is the fulfillment in my life is not coming from financial material gain. Those are needs that I like and enjoy, et cetera in my life is being who I want to be and having the opportunity, the wonderful opportunity of seeing all that's going on around me and that the economic way of thinking is just opened up by understanding, seeing all the connectedness of all of it. It's been a joyful ride of inquiry for me thanks to this wonderful person, Milton Friedman. And I leave here tonight hoping that at least some of you might help me carry that inquiry further long after I'm not around to do so. Thank you. Do you your stance on our current economic situation? There's a particular, you know, a regulation that yeah. is in place. 
I'm going to surprise you in a way, I surprised myself in a way, because I was asked recently, I was in Arkansas about six weeks or seven weeks ago, and one of the students who had been at Cap and Talk, they had started a group there, which I'm very excited about. And uh, we were talking, and one of them asked me, what did I think was the biggest challenge? What? Why? Why were, would people not support the logic of the ideas that I've been putting forward? And my answer was religion, in a very indirect way. But it's this. It is the failure of, for example, if I don't communicate to you that I'm a decent person, you're not going to listen to what I have to say. Uh, it, uh, it's a failure for us to, to communicate that if we come forward, you had an idea, you stated it in terms of the corporations and how they should operate. I can say, well, you don't give a damn. You don't give a damn about those people because I've immediately inferred that he doesn't, he's not a good person because he isn't concerned about the problem. He didn't say that at all. What he said was, my understanding from my reading and thinking, etc., is corporations are going to benefit all of us best if we focus on the bottom line. Because in doing so, they are maximizing what is possible rather than pursuing the dream. And the problem with the religion is that if you say you're an evangelical, that sh or, or a Muslim, or a Mormon, or whatever, that should have nothing to do with my understanding of how you feel people ought to be treated. And yet we go there all the time. That's you. So I, I feel like that kind of leads to the question of, so do you think that the problem with religion and economics is that they put moral phrasing, and it, it's almost like a morality issue instead of a purely economic? Yeah, yeah. I, I go further than that. I just tell you flat out, there's not a single person in this room that has any belief that's not based on faith. Not a single position you hold will I accept the fact that a good bit of it, 80, 85 percent, is based on faith. How you came to that position is the individual trail that we all follow. Maybe it was parents that got you there or whatever. Uh, Jonathan Haidt, a name you all should at least consider thinking about looking at his stuff, psychologist. And the way he describes it is, we kid ourselves in thinking uh, that we are driving the elephant, the elephant being our emotions. But we are not. We are sitting on top of the elephant going where the elephant wants to go, and we're using our brains to justify why we're going there. And that gets you back to the question of faith. So that's why, and I think it's a difficult one. How do you address that? I can identify it, but I don't know how, other than a group like this where I can get you to the point where you see my Winnie the Pooh tie, and you think, well, I can't be too bad a guy because he wears the Winnie the Pooh tie. And you're willing to then be open enough to think about something that I've said that probably is totally off the wall for what you've thought about before. Yes, sir. Uh, when it comes to economic policy, um, it's probably a combination of both. But do you think the problems that we face is more of a political issue or more of a lack of economic literacy among the governing uh, governing classes? One, I don't ascribe to economic literacy. I'm sorry, Peter. Whoever sued me. I, I, I think we can spend and have spent millions and billions of dollars on various schemes to educate people economically. And I, my answer to that is, uh, in a free society, it's ironic. The fact that we have a free society, a prospering free market society, is what stands in the way of people understanding ideas because why should we? I don't have to understand these ideas to make $100,000 a year. 
if I ha have any degree of drive, any degree of ingenuity, I can do that. I, I, I met a father and son who are, in their, job, their business is installing carpets for Home Depot. And the son is like 26 years old, decided, I think he went to college for a year and that was the end of that, said, hey, and he and his father started this business to subcontract with Home Depot to install carpets and people went there and buy it. And the father said to me, he said, yeah, I can't remember the son's name, but he said to me, he said, yeah. He said, yeah, we do a lot of this and we're doing very well. He said, you see that uh, huge, uh, it was a Dodge Ram with the four wheels in the back thing, you know, the, I didn't notice if he had a gun rack there, but it probably fit that characteristic. And he said, yeah, he owns that outright, and he just bought a house for cash. Now, somebody like that is not likely. He's going to want to go to the NFL games. He want to go this, go do that. And he's not going to likely take the time to even come to a lecture like this and give himself a little bit of exposure. So my challenge, that's why we tend to try to be in the media business, is to find ways to pour stuff out in the media that's gonna be very easy for somebody to take in. And maybe some of those people will take the time to go further. But to try to think that you're gonna change voting habits by doing that, one of the challenges I have is convincing people to accept the ideas without feeling necessary to have them understand them. There's a real moral test there because that means I could manipulate and use the skills. And, and by the way, quick little lesson, sophistry and rhetoric. Any Greek scholars here? Well, so none of you will challenge me, but you can go and check it. In Greece, there were two traditions, rhetoric, and rhetoric was the use of language and using it in a way that was to persuade, to explain, etc. The sophists were those who took it upon themselves to learn the techniques of tricking people with language. We are flooded with sophists in this country uh, who go around as Republicans and Democrats engaging in the use of words in ways that fundamentally, not intentionally, by the way, I'm not saying these are, these are pe bad people. Most of them think they're doing great things. But they, they just overlook the fact that how does a single entity, little math, I said I did 20 votes today, whatever. Multiply that quickly by how many people here. Multiply that by the number of millions of people in the United States. And how many transactions is that? Do, 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 do. I don't know, trillion something or other transactions that occur every day. How does any entity control that? And yet that's what government says it will do. Sorry, that's a pessimistic thing. Tom Sowell once told me, I asked him, I said, Tom, are you still a pessimist? He said, yeah, except on the days I think it's hopeless. <laughs> but I am not hopeless, I am optimistic. Any more, at least one more question probably we can squeeze in. Yes? How important do you think being open-minded and unbiased in policy and lawmaking and just decision-making in general, how important do you think that is in the process of, of making decisions? I think it's fundamentally important, but I, I'm hesitating on definitions, asking questions again about what do we mean by bias? Does that mean that I have no opinion? Does that mean I have no uh, sense? Uh, does that mean that I lack any effort to understand? Uh, because we, we tend to use the phrase in a negative sense. That if I say to you that the evidence is clear that Sweden is not an example of uh, the success of socialism, what you don't know and I know is that Sweden in the uh, 19th century, 1800s, late 1800s, and early 20th century, through all the way through, by the way, the 90s, Sweden was ranked in probably uh, these various uh, indexes of 
wealth countries and all that stuff, they ranked about fourth or fifth or sixth in the world. And so what did they do? They said, well, we can afford all this welfare. And in the mid nineties, their economy was tanking and I think they dropped to 40th or something. And what did they do? They reformed and they came back. Uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's also generational. How many of you really have a sense of what your parents went through to get where they are? I don't care where they are. I don't care who they are. You did? You had a sense of it, direct sense? Most of us know by family history, but, but our parents, when we're five, six, seven, up to 10, 11 years, that's when your parents have been working and struggling and building their, their whatever success they've had, and we don't see it. So it's hard for us. We, have, we don't have that as a role model of what we're gonna to have to go through to do that. And how tough it is and how much work that's gonna to have to happen. And so as a result, we say, geez, you guys had it so good. Look at, you got this house. I'm one of my board members, and I'll leave you with this kind of story. And it's kind of, a, to me, it was a distressing story. The, the son is a trust fund baby, if you would. And he once even said to me that he didn't see anything wrong with that. And this is a guy who's in his mid-20s when he's telling me this. This is not whatever. And then I heard his mother complaining to his father that it's, it, it is just terrible that Tom can't afford a house in San Francisco. He's got to buy a house way out there in Walnut Creek or wherever it was because he can't afford a house. Now, Tom is living off of a couple million or whatever it was that his dad gave him as a trust. And I'm just thinking, ah, oh. <laughs> anyway, there is no shortcut. Free market capitalism is not easy, but ultimately it works. My final message. Thank you.